have a few boys and girls today, so we're going to sing one for them as well. Did you ever talk to God above? Tell him that you need a friend to love. This is for all of us, really, but I picked this one for the boys and girls. I will serve thee because I love thee. You have given life to me.
If you could easily jump in there to heartaches, you just have to wait on those four lovely beats. This is the last one this morning. There is coming a day when no heartaches shall come, no more clouds in the sky, no more tears to dim the eye. Sometimes life is tough, and we all know that, and there are many folks going through tough times today, and some have lost loved ones, others waiting round bedsides. And it's good for us as believers just to remember these words. There's coming a day when no heartache shall come, no more clouds in the sky, and no more tears to dim the eye. Let's sing it thoughtfully. This is our last one. day that will be. We're going to stand this time and sing our opening hymn. O Lord my God, when I an awesome wonder, consider all the works thy hand hath made. And when you and I look out across our world in this beautiful weather, although some parts of our, of our world are having tough times, but we see all the evidence of God and his handiwork. Let's stand and sing this together. O Lord my God.
Amen. Now let's just bow quietly together. We have come to worship the Lord, and we do that not only in our praise, but also in our prayers. And let's just come quietly and ask for his blessing upon us. Our God and our Father, our souls are related within us as we just ponder the words of these lovely hymns and choruses that already we have been singing. The psalmist reminds us that great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. And Father, it's our great delight to lift our hearts to you and to lift our voices to you as we sing your praise. And as we think, our Father, about the words that we have been singing, we can only say today how great thou art, how great thou art. Father, you're the one who created all things out of nothing. You are the one who sustains all things by the word of your power. You are the one, our Father, who constantly and continually watches over his children, providing everything that we need. And you're not just a great God, but you're a good God. And we want to pause and acknowledge all the goodness of God toward us. Father, we want to thank you for ever sending your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, into the world to be our Savior. We've been singing just now, and when I think that God, his Son, not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. And Father, we can't because we are hell-deserving sinners. At our very best, there was nothing good to be seen in us, nothing good to be said about us. And yet God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And from hearts that are filled with gratitude, with thanksgiving, we want to say again today, thank you, Lord, for saving our souls. Thank you for going to that old rugged cross and giving your life in place of guilty sinners like us. We rejoice in our salvation, and we thank you that you're a wonderful Savior. We come to ask your blessing, our Father, upon our time together here. You know the need of every heart, and we just commend ourselves to you collectively and individually and we pray God's blessing upon us. You know who we are. You know where we are. You know everything that we're facing on the pathway of life. And Father God, draw near to us, we ask. Speak even if we don't expect you to. Open up our hearts and our minds and let us hear the voice of God come to us with freshness and relevance. And give us, our Father, we pray, the ability, the willingness to respond to your word. Remember all those, our Father, who can't meet with us. We think of those who have been coming through times of bereavement, and we ask God's blessing upon them. We think of those led aside just now, and we pray for them. We think of Helen in hospital. We think of Simon at home. We pray, Father, today for our sister Irene, who has been through surgery recently. And Father, there are so many more over these past number of months who have been coping with bad health, and we want to commend them to you. And we ask, our Father, that you would lay your healing touch upon each one of them, and that you would watch over them. We pray for those on holidays, that you'll be with them. We ask, our Father, that you'll refresh them, keep them safe, and bring them safely home to us. For everywhere where your word will be preached this day, Father, we commend it to you and all your servants. But Father, sometimes your servants climb into a pulpit to feed the hearts, the lives of your people, and sometimes they themselves are down, and they're discouraged, and they wonder whether they've got the right word from God or not. So everyone who climbs into a pulpit right across our province, Father, would you bless them and empower them with your Holy Spirit, that they might be used of God for the upbuilding of your people. 
and that through the Word of God that is preached and the power of the Holy Spirit that men and women and young people, boys and girls, will come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. Remember Adam as he speaks this morning with us here about Holiday Bible Club. We just pray for him, take all nervousness from him, and grant the help of the Spirit of God to him as well, that we might learn much about this today. So, Father, these are our prayers, wherein we have failed you this week, where we have sinned against you in thought, word, or deed. Please forgive us. We really do long to worship you in the beauty of holiness. So draw near to us and help us in turn to draw near to you with the clean hands, with pure hearts. And may our worship be acceptable to you. And we ask it all in our Savior's precious name. Amen. Amen. Now, I want to welcome all of you who are in the building this morning. I know it is what we term the twelfth fortnight, a lot of folks coming and going, and that's understandable. So we have been praying that God will keep them and bless them during their holidays. But we thank you for coming out to meet with us here in Banbridge Baptist Church this morning. And all who are listening in live on Facebook, well, we welcome you as well and pray God's blessing upon you. After the ministry of God's Word, we meet around the Lord's table to remember our Lord Jesus Christ in his own appointed way by the breaking of bread and also the drinking of a cup. If you're saved and walking in fellowship with the Lord, please wait with us as we break bread together. If you're not staying for the table, I know this is repetitive, but it's important if you're visiting, would you just please stand up during the closing hymn? And if you can't do that, well, then just remain there and put your hand up if you're leaving, and one of the office spurs will come and show you out. 6.30 tonight is our gospel meeting. God willing, I'll be preaching, and David McCarthy will be along to minister in song. Wednesday night, 8 o'clock, prayer meeting from 8 o'clock through until 9. Then Thursday night at half past 7, there will be a holiday Bible club prayer meeting. Now, that's not just restricted, of course, to those who are going to be helping in the holiday Bible club. You can come and join with us on that occasion too. Please remember that our Holiday Bible Club will take place from Monday the 2nd to Friday the 6th of August. Adam's going to come in a few moments, and he's going to talk about that instead of a children's talk, because this is a very important part of our work throughout the summer. And if you intend to help in the Holiday Bible Club, please see either Adam or Letitia, and do that as soon as possible, or keep up to date on the WhatsApp Holiday Bible Group. Please remember also that you need to be access and checked. Please don't come and be prepared to help out if you haven't done that, because this announcement has been made now for a number of weeks. If you have any questions about it, please see Sam Campbell as soon as possible. Next Lord's Day, 10.45 over in the soft furnishing area, we meet for a little time of prayer. Then 11.20, we'll meet here in the building to worship the Lord. 11.30, we will commence our morning meeting and the breaking of bread and then half past six at night, the gospel meeting. The singers expected our revival, and I will be preaching at both services. Now, there's been a lot of talk and a lot of debate recently about the subject of abortion. These folks have been seeking to stand up, and not only to stand up, but to stand outside abortion clinics. And also, they have been trying to work with the government, both locally and across the water, about what will soon be forced upon us. And I'd like you to take one of these with you and read it, because if you read it, it will help you to understand what abortion really is and why we should be telling people that it's wrong and as Christians responding to our conscience and not to be afraid to speak up when we have to. Now, these are all the announcements that are made subject, as always, to the sovereign will of God. Now, Adam's going to come and speak to all of us about the Holiday Bible Club, which is fast approaching. Thank you. Morning, everyone. Morning. Caught up here. Um, I just want to say, first of all, thanks very much to anyone who has come forward about helping out at Holiday Bible Club. It really, really is appreciated. Um, and thanks as well, Ivan, if you stick up the next slide there, please. 
Um, thanks as well to Alicia for designing this logo this year and our invitation. It's really, really well done and we really appreciate that, Alicia. However, we still need more volunteers. So if you're free that week at all, just get in contact with either Tish or myself and we can slot you in somewhere. It doesn't have to be the full week. If you can make one day, two days, three days, it doesn't really matter. Um, we'll be able to slot you in and tell you um, where you will be at. So there's loads of areas to help out at. And as well as that, I forgot to mention, if you're, uh, if you're in secondary school or above, you can come in as a junior helper as well. Tish told me to tell you, you could put it in your CV as well. Um, if you are doing your, I don't know, if you are applying for jobs at 13, but um, anyways, you can put it there anyway. So yes, junior helpers, if you're secondary school age or above, that would be really, really helpful. And as well as that, because you are under 18, you don't need to be access and I, so don't have to worry about any of that. Um, yes, there's loads of areas to help out with. There's crafts, there's leading a group, there's registration, games, the story. Um, so you don't have to do anything you're not comfortable with, so don't be worrying about that. As mentioned, it goes from the 2nd to the 6th of August, and it is from age P1 to age P7, and it is from 6.45 to 8.15 at night. And our theme this year is Detective Week, right? So for any children here today, you do not want to miss this. Uh, it's, it's going to be so much fun. And as detectives, what we're going to be investigating this year is who is Jesus, okay? So we're going to be looking for clues through God's Word, the Bible, to solve our case this week, this year of who is Jesus. There'll be fun, there'll be games, there'll be Bible lessons, crafts, investigations, and loads of surprises as well. So come along and make sure you tell your friends as well. There's actually a link going around. Dave Selwood is going to be sending the link around today. He has a load of emails um, and you can click on that link to register and that'll give, you'll have to give all your details, all your contact numbers, whatever, for, for your parents. And so that'll all be done electronically this year, which will be really handy. So check out your email today for a message from Dave Selwood. And if you don't get one, again, just message one of us, message myself or Tish, and we'll sort you out with that link and make sure you're registered. So you have to register this year before you come down, just with everything going on. That's perfect. So here's a picture of a detective. And since Peter isn't here this week to defend himself, we have volunteered him to be our chief detective this year. And he'll be dressed up for the job too. So if anyone has any of these items of clothing in their wardrobe, first of all, I feel sorry for you. But um, make sure you get in contact with us. I'm pretty sure Woody have seen you in a hat like that before. So I'll be around to your house later on. And get in contact with us and uh, we can take your clothes off you for a week and give them to Peter and dress them up. And finally, even if you're not able to come and be there in be there physically, would really, really appreciate prayer for the week. Um, because at the end of the day, if God's not in it, nothing's going to happen. So here's just a few points for prayer for the week, that God would be at the center. We want, we want God to be at the center of all the plans, all the preparations, all the stories, everything. Um, so really appreciate that point of prayer. Next, safety for the children for the week. With everything going on, we want to make sure we do, we're doing everything by the book. We want to make sure we're abiding by all the restrictions and all the laws or whatever. So really, um, that's a really important point as well. Safety for the children for the week. Next, good weather. We'd, we'd love to be able to go outside. It's easy to think it's going to be amazing weather when we're sitting roasting today. But it's August, so it's a couple of weeks away. You know what this country's like. Um, so pray for good weather, because if it's good weather, we can go outside. And that means with everything going on, it's a lot safer and a lot better to be outside. So pray for that as well. And lastly, pray for salvation. That's what we're, we really want to see. We really want to see God moving this week. And we really want um, to see children give their lives to God and have their lives change from this point on and go on to do amazing things for God. So just... When we're on that topic, I'm just going to pray for a minute here and give the week over to God. Um, so, 
Father God, I thank you so much for this opportunity that we have, Lord, to come and do Holiday Bible Club. Lord, it's, it's amazing that even thinking back to how life changed from last year, Lord, we're able to do this again this year. And we give you the, all, all the glory and all the praise for that, God, because it's only because of you. Father, we pray for um, the, the logistics of this week, Father. We pray for the preparations that you'll be in all the preparations. We pray for the, um, the, the organization, Lord. We pray for the volunteers. You'll bring the right volunteers forward, Lord. You'll be stirring people's hearts, Lord, that they can volunteer, Lord, even if it's pouring a few cups of water, Lord, or if it's up at the front telling a story, Lord, whatever it is, Father, I pray that you'll be stirring hearts this morning to come forward and volunteer, Father. We pray for safety of the children this week, God. We give that all over to you. We don't want anything going on, Lord. We don't want any um, sickness breaking out, Lord. We don't want any uh, restrictions to be broken, anything like that, Lord. So we really pray and give that all over to you. It's complicated, Lord, but you're able to solve it. And God, I pray for good weather. Thank you, Lord, for blessing us with amazing weather this week. It's been just such a nice change, Lord. It's been such a nice uh, week to lift our spirits, Lord, in the midst of everything. And I pray the same for Holiday Bible Club Week, Lord. So I pray that you'll really just um, keep the sun out and keep the rain away, Father. And we give that over to you as well. Lastly, Lord, we pray for salvation for the children. We really do want to see lives change this week, Lord, and um, kids giving their, their lives over to you when they're young, God, and not going down a, 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 a bad path, Lord, but really, really just giving themselves over onto you, Lord, and um, being able to be used by you, Father. And I pray, even as leaders this week, God, that we'll leave this week changed as well. We'll leave this work this week with a deeper love for you, Lord, a deeper love for your word and a deeper love for serving you, Father. Um, I really pray for each and every volunteer that they could be blessed mightily, Lord, in, in a big way for doing this week, Lord. And I thank you for everything you do for us, Lord. I thank you for such well volunteers, for everything that you have done so far, Lord. And I pray that you'll help us to start well and to finish well, Father. Um, I give this all over to you now, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, just in case you're wondering where Inspector Cluso is at the moment, he's on holidays, and when he comes back, well, he'll have something I'm sure to live up to after this. Let's sing a lovely hymn together just to prepare our hearts as we come in a moment to the Word of God. There's a lovely hymn, I need thee every hour, most gracious Lord, no tender voice like thine can peace afford. Let's stand and sing this together. Yes.
Now let's just pray for a moment and then we'll read the Word of God together. Let's pray. Father, we have been expressing in the words of this lovely hymn our great need of you this morning. Our walk with God is not something whereby we need you once a year or when the difficulties of life come. Father, the truth is that we need you every day. We need you every hour. We need you for every moment of that hour. And Father God, we recognize that and we come just now to you and we say again, O oh, bless me now, my Savior, I come to thee. Bless us as we come to read your word and then as we meditate upon it, Bless Elaine as she goes out to testify at the bush tonight. She needs you, and she will need you again tonight. Father, bless her, we pray, and use her that folks will come to know Christ through her testimony. Father, I'm sure that all of us have the difficulties throughout the week in one way or another, but we come to be quiet, to be still before you, with the Word of God open to hear what God the Lord would say to us. So bless us, we pray, as we read your Word and meditate upon it. We ask it all in our Saviour's name. Amen. Turn with me, please, this morning to 1 Peter, and to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3, we're going to read the first seven verses together. 1 Peter 3, verses 1 to 7. Let's listen. Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they, without a word, may be won by the conduct of their wives when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied or coupled with fear. Whose adorning let it not be that outward adorning of plaiting the hair and of wearing of gold, or of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ador ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of greater price. For after this manner in the old time, the holy woman also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are as long as ye do well, and are not afraid with any amazement. The words there simply mean terror, afraid with any terror. Likewise ye husbands dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Amen. God will add his blessing to the reading of his precious word. You may remember that last Sunday morning we were thinking about the sufferings of Christ, and the reason why we were thinking about that is because these Christians who were suffering in many different ways Peter wanted them to put their own suffering in perspective, and they could do that by thinking about the suffering that Christ himself had to endure on the cross for sinners like us. And Peter drew the attention of the slaves, the house servants, to the Lord Jesus Christ, because very often some of these, these slaves were treated badly, and their masters were very cruel and very inconsiderate. And they were just a slave in the eyes of their masters, not a person, and they were treated shamefully, and they were often punished without any provocation. And Peter says to them, listen, if you want to understand why you're suffering and all the implications of this, just think for a moment about the sufferings of the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, he gave us the example of our Savior. He was falsely accused, rejected by the authorities, shamefully treated, reviled, and yet he reviled not again, and he suffered at the hands of his enemies. So the example of the Lord Jesus Christ in the midst of wrongdoing was to be submissive, humble, and not to retaliate. 
And then, of course, he went into greater detail about the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, Christ suffered for us, who his own self bear our sins in his own body, that we should be dead to sins and should live unto righteousness by whose stripes we are healed. You see, our example in life is also our substitute in death. And it's always good to have an example in life. But more importantly, we need to have a Savior in death, because when death comes and we leave the scene of time and go out into eternity, we need to make sure that it's well with our soul. And it can be, because Christ suffered for us. He took our pleas, died for our sins, and bore our punishment. And Peter says, whenever you begin to understand something of the sufferings of the Lord Jesus Christ, that will help you, thinking about these believers, and for many believers today, he says that will help you to put your own suffering into perspective. Now, we come here to 1 Peter 3, to some very challenging and very important verses where we see some practical considerations for husbands and wives. I said to Christine, by the time I finish this morning, nobody will speak to me at the door. But you know what? Whether that's true or not doesn't matter. The important thing is that in a day when marriages are under attack, and I'm talking about Christian marriages, it is so important that we understand what the Bible says about these practical issues concerning marriage, but in particular, husbands and wives. Now, it's interesting that both the Apostle Peter and also the Apostle Paul give us instructions regarding both husbands and wives. Why do they do that? Well, in their epistles, they do that so that you and I might see something of the importance of family life. And not only that, but we see how important it is for the family unit to actually work, because every family unit is important to the well-being of our society, and how the relationship between the husband and wife takes place will say a lot as to whether or not that family unit remains together. Now, I understand we live in a fallen world. I also understand that marriage for many today doesn't mean anything. But whether that's true or not, the important thing is this. Whenever you come to the Word of God with me to 1 Peter 3 this morning, you'll see that God has something to say of great importance about the family unit and about the marriage bond. Peter simply continues along his thoughts before, and he's been on, remember, the thought of submission. And now he continues with this thought of submission, and he speaks about the husband, and he speaks about the wife, and about the responsibilities that both have within the marriage bond. Beloved, you cannot say to me today, looking out at the world in which we live, that there hasn't been a great erosion of family life. And I'm not talking simply about the world outside who really don't build their lives on the Word of God. They do their own thing. They live by their own standards. Whether it's right or wrong, it doesn't matter to them. They just get on with life. But as far as the Christian is concerned, it's a different matter entirely because whether it's in everyday living, living in the workplace, living in our homes, everything is governed by the Word of God. And I have a great fear today that we have lost the importance of biblical teaching on the subject of marriage. I know many marriages are under duress. I understand that they don't always run smoothly. But when we hear of so many places in our province and further afield where people are divorcing simply, and where marriages are breaking down, you have to sit down and say, well, look, why is this? Is family life no longer deemed to be important? Is the Word of God no longer that which governs how we understand His Word and His principles? 
for things like marriage and for men and women within that marriage bond. Let's listen to what Peter says here. Because if you're a husband like me, I'm going to tell you today, this is challenging. I had the privilege this morning before I preached this to say sorry to my wife already. You'll have to do that when you go home. But you know what? It is challenging, but it's so important. So to the role of the wife within the home. And it's interesting that here we begin with the conduct of the wife. Now, wives, please, this morning, bear with me. Peter uses this, first of all, because he's continuing in the context of submission. Remember, he has already talked about believers submitting to those in authority, whether they're good or bad. That's not the issue. The powers that be are ordained of God. And we have to learn to submit to those in authority over us unless, unless they ask us to do something against the Word of God or our Christian faith. And then the answer is, well, we ought to obey God rather than men. Then, of course, he has spoken about submission to masters, and that was for household servants and for all of us in the place of employment. And sometimes you have to suffer on the wrong, but you've got to do it in a Christ-like way, because Christ is our example to follow. But then he says this, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands. The word likewise is simply translated as the words in the same way. So what Peter is doing, he's talking about submission, those in authority over us. He's speaking about submission for those who are household servants, but quite applicable for all of us in the place of employment. And then he says, now likewise, ye wives be in subjection to your own husbands. The word simply means in the same way. Another translation. In the same way, ye wives, be in submission to your own husbands. Let me say something from a very general and practical point of view, first of all, because we will look later in a moment at what Peter says specifically about the wife. Peter's not suggesting for one moment in the use of these words in the same way that wives should see themselves as slaves to their husbands. That's not what he's saying. And for the husbands today, he's very clear. He's not saying that your wife should be a slave to you. Some men think like that. Some men have lived like that all their years. They treat their wives abysmally. They lord it over them in a way that is neither biblical, profitable, and therefore it's not Christ-like. They've confused headship with dictatorship, and they've made their wives and their marriages a misery. Now, Peter's not suggesting here that wives are to be treated like slaves. He's saying that in this area of submission, there are certain things that wives need to take to heart with regards to their relationship with their husbands. He's stating that although both are equal in the sight of God, they have different roles to fulfill in God's order of things. And when both accept that order, then things are the way God intended them to be. So what does he say? Well, as far as the wife is concerned, firstly, there is her submission. Verse 1, be in submission to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. That word submission in this context simply means to place under rank. What Peter's simply doing is reminding them that God has an order for everything, even within the marriage bond. And Peter says, listen, we must get into our place. God is in order for the husband and wife within the marriage bond. The husband is the head of the home, and as he submits to Christ, so too should the wife submit to him. It's very clear here that Peter, of course, is addressing women who had unsaved husbands, because he says, be in subjection to your own husbands, 
that if any obey not the word. These people are not Christians that he has in mind here. And sometimes people say to me, well, Pastor, my husband's not saved. What do I do? How do I say things to him? How, how do I pluck up the courage at times to tell him things about me and my faith? Well, Peter's very helpful here. You see, in the first century, a wife was expected to profess the same religion as her husband. It didn't matter what that religion might be. If a wife got saved and became a Christian, well, that was a different story. She might have a joy in her heart, but she had a husband who might not share her enthusiasm. And in the first century, whenever a woman came to know Christ as her Savior with an unsaved husband, well, that meant that he saw her as being unfaithful to him. He saw it as an act of betrayal on the part of his wife, and therefore he often wanted nothing to do with her, and he wanted nothing to do with her Christian faith. Now, like every era, many wives have unsaved husbands. Peter says, look, even if your husband is unsaved, respect them. Respect God's order. Submit to your husband. It might be difficult because of your faith. But God has an order. And in God's order of things, the husband is the head of the home. Now, there are great difficulties when one partner is saved and the other partner is not. I understand that, and I respect that greatly. But Peter says, look, if you have an unsaved husband, submit to him. Live right before him. Because in this way, you just might win that unsaved husband to Christ. In other words, Peter says to them, look, live an exemplary life before your husband. Not only is that God's order, but the fact is that this could be the very means of seeing your husband saved by your exemplary conduct. So not only is it important for the wife to accept God's order of things and to submit to her husband, but Peter says the way she conducts herself might win her husband to Christ. So I know we're living in changing days. In every aspect, not just out in society, but very often in the life of the church. But you know one thing doesn't change amongst many other things that don't change, and that is God's order for the home. It's already settled. It is what it is. It's the way that God wants it to be. The husband's the head of the home as he submits to Christ, so too the wife submits to her husband in the home. There's her submission. There's her character. Verse 3 and 4. Whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plaiting the hair of wearing of gold, of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God, great price. What's Peter saying? He says, as far as the wife's character is concerned, don't be too concerned about the earthward appearance, but be concerned about your inner beauty. Now, let's be clear about this. Peter's not saying that the wife shouldn't look good for her husband. He's not saying the wife shouldn't take care of her appearance. He's not suggesting it would be better for his wife to walk around shabbily. He says, look, we're talking here about access. We're talking about elaborate dress and jewelry. He says that the inward beauty and a gentle spirit is much more important than outward appearance. Now, that seems strange in his culture because it was common in his day to see excess of makeup, jewelry, and clothing. And Peter mentions three things. He says there's the plating of the hair, which was common in the Greek world and the Roman world because there were many women who sought to reveal extravagant hairstyles, which one commentator says bordered on the ridiculous. There's the wearing of gold jewelry. Common in Peter's day in the Roman world, a woman would have wore lots of it all over her body. 
There's the putting on of apparel. That simply refers to expensive, extravagant clothes. And they were worn by the woman to show off their bodies and make them appealing to their men. It was all about impressing. It was about standing out in the crowd. And Peter says, look, these outward things are not the most important things in the lives of Christian women. There are things like gentleness, quietness, things that other people can never see. But it's those things that are well-pleasing to God to display gentleness and weakness is of great worth in God's sight. There's her submission, there's her character, and then there's her example, verse 5 and 6. For after this manner in the old time, the holy woman also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well and are not afraid with any terror. And Peter takes an example from the Old Testament. He actually mentions Sarah, who we know is the wife of Abraham. And Peter appeals to the Old Testament Scriptures because he's saying to these wives, look, this is not something that is new. This is the way it has been from the beginning of time. Sarah's numbered, we know, amongst those whom Peter calls holy woman. Why was she holy? Was she perfect? No. Do you see, if you want a perfect wife today, forget about it. And if you think you're a perfect husband today, forget about it. Because that's not the way it is. And Sarah wasn't perfect, but she trusted in God. Her hope was in God. The virtues that she cultivated were so important that it was noted in her outward appearance. She respected her husband. She submitted to her husband. She even addressed him as master. You say, Pastor, hold on a moment. I agree with you. We don't run around in our culture today, and none of our wives run around addressing us as master. They might call us all kinds of things, and we'll not go into that, but certainly not master. But what Peter is simply saying is this. When Peter says that Sarah obeyed Abraham, he's just saying that she's a good godly example. She's the mother of all women of God who fear God and who do what is right. Her faith was in God. Her submission was to God's order. Her respect was for her husband. And all of these principles are good to follow. Because Peter says they're well-pleasing to God. The conduct of the wife, submission, character, and example. Now, having lost the friendship of half the church, let's come to the conduct of the husband. One verse. You say, Pastor, does that mean then that the woman needed it three times more? No. No. You see within this one verse, you listen to it. Peter says of the husbands likewise, in the same way, that's what the word means, in the same way, ye husbands dwell with them, according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. So when Peter uses the word likewise, you know what he's saying? He's saying to me as a husband, and he's saying to you as a husband, listen, you're under authority too. You have to submit to God's order of things. You have to live in a way that is pleasing to God. If you expect your wife to live according to you, then you too must live according to the Word of God. And he mentions three things. He deals with it really in a threefold way. Firstly, there is his consideration of his wife. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them, according to knowledge. I like this translation. It's easier to understand. Husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way. I tell you, there are many of us today, including me, and we need to listen to those four words again. Live 
with your wives. Live with your wives. Because sadly, many husbands today are so busy with other things, they have no time for their wives. Some of us as husbands are so busy at work, we can be seldom at home. I know we all need to work, and I know bills need to be paid, and I know there's pressure on every home. But husbands, you and I need to spend quality time with our wives. Sometimes people laugh at me, especially at my age, when I say, can't do it that night of a date night. You say, Pastor, you're still not dating. No. No. I've got a wife. But sometimes, husbands, you need to set aside a special time, a little time, where you and your wife can be together. I know family is great, and quality time with family is great. But sometimes a husband needs to be alone with his wife and out together, walk on the beach, doing something other than being in the home. I believe Peter's here addressing Christian husbands because he mentions their prayer life. It might well be that these Christian husbands had unsaved wives, but whether they were unsaved or not, the principles are still the same. He wants these husbands to love their wives in a Christian manner because a husband will always have a special place in his heart for his wife. Husband today, do we, do we love our wives in accordance with the Word of God? Are we considerate toward them, understanding them with all their ups and downs, their good and bad days, and those things in their life that you and I might say, I don't like? Well, let me tell you this, there are things in your life that your wife probably doesn't like either. But they deserve to be treated with love and respect because that's what God's Word depends or demands of us. Listen to Paul in Ephesians 5. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the Word that he might present it to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that it should be holy and without blemish. Men ought to love their wives as their own bodies. Not here to study Ephesians 5 this morning. But husbands, listen, the kind of love God demands, and it's a command. It's not an optional extra in the marriage, it's a demand. It's sacrificial. Husband, love your wives even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. You see, that's the standard that lifts the Christian marriage to its highest possible standard, Love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. It's purifying. Christ cleansed the church, consecrated it to himself. And as husbands today, we have the responsibility to look after the spiritual welfare of our wives. Do we pray for them? Do we give them a good spiritual lead in the home? Do we live by example? Are our lives good and godly? Do we live in a way that's going to help them spiritually? I say this very reverently. You can agree to disagree with me. But you see in our society today, and the cry is the same in almost every church of every denomination, men, it's time to man up. It's time to man up, and it's time to get your family out to church under the sound of God's Word. Because if you don't do it, somebody will lead them somewhere else, and they might never come through the door of the church, and not just them, their children and generations to come. Why? Because we decided to be lazy spiritually and didn't come ourselves. That can't be right. Paul says this love's sacrificial, it's purifying, it's unbreakable. When a man and a woman are joined together, it's a permanent union. Yes, I know we live in a fallen world. Things happen, things do break up, but God's ideal 
Marriage is God's act of joining a woman and a man in a permanent covenant in one flesh relationship. If we decide to break that, then we're going to be ultimately accountable to God. Husbands, I say this to my heart and to yours. Treat your wife with dignity, respect courtesy, with kindness, and above all else, love them and tell them that you love them. There's this consideration of his wife, his respect for a wife. I'll finish in a moment. Husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel as being heirs together of the grace of life. Peter says the wives or the weaker partner in the marriage bond. The word that he uses here refers to physical stamina. He's not saying the wife is any less important. He's just saying the man is normally stronger than the two. The husband, therefore, should, he should burden or have the shoulder to burden and carry them. He's reminding us the husband should protect his wife, provide for her needs. You see, the problem is that too many men today want authority in the home and they want submission from their wives, but they neglect to look after them. Why should we look after them? What does Peter mean here? Does he say that the women are inferior? No, he says they're heirs together of the grace of God, equal as far as God is concerned. We're both one in Christ. The wife is a special to Christ as the husband is. They're just different. They have different roles, but they're both important to God. And here's the last little thought. There's his consideration of his wife. There's his respect for his wife, and there are his prayers for his wife. Maybe that's where many of us as husbands fall down. But Peter says, likewise, ye husbands, Dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life. Why? That your prayers, your prayers be not hindered. What's Peter saying? Well, I believe that husbands and wives should pray together, but they should also take time to pray for each other. If there's a spirit of strife or contention, deal with it. Because a husband who doesn't respect his wife will not be able to pray for her. That's basically what Peter's saying. You see, in the home, the husband ought to take the lead. He ought to give spiritual leadership to his wife and to his family. And when we choose as husbands to neglect to do that, we're failing at our God-given responsibility. Some practical considerations for husbands and wives, they're very challenging. I don't joke when I say it gives me opportunity today to say sorry in so many aspects of life. Because sometimes we get into a rut and we take things for granted. The conduct of the wife, submission, character, inner beauty, and her example to her husband. The conduct of the husband, his consideration of his wife, respect for his wife, his prayers for his wife. You might say, but pastor, that doesn't make our married life easy. No, it doesn't. But nothing about life is easy. The easiest thing to do today is to forget about your vows, give up on your marriage, and perhaps live to regret it for the rest of your life. Oh, God needs to help me today. And he needs to help all of us to fulfill our responsibilities to each other, to know what marriage is about, what love is within that marriage, and lives that are well-pleasing to him. Let's pray. Father, we have certainly not found it easy this morning 
to come to this passage, but we just can't leave it. We have to be honest about it. Even if that means today we have got to look within our own hearts, our homes, our marriages, because this is of the utmost importance to you. We remember how Adam in the garden, you looked upon him and you took from him a rib from which you formed his wife and you brought them together in an unbreakable union. Marriage is important, our Father, to you because you were the first marriage ceremony. Just help us as husbands and wives to live wisely, to love deeply, and help us, Father, to set a good example to each other. And when we feel and where we have failed, just give us the humility to sit down and to talk things through together and to resolve those things that hurt, that they might be healed. Please help us in this area. We ask today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's sing together a lovely hymn. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died. Just remain seating until the other spurs come to direct you out. And if you're making your way home, thank you for being out. And may God bless those of us who remain.